welcome to a first draft video for FPL game week one and this is for the 2021-2022 season and of course it's been a long while since we've been talking about the Premier League. We also had Euro Fantasy Football but now completely focused on FPL and less than a month away uh, from the, the beginning of the season so we're going to be right into the thick of it very very soon and uh, it's very important to be prepared and to have a good idea of how your team's going to look like. Having said that, there will be changes and in future videos, including team selection videos, previews, deadline streams, etc. I'll be updating you with how my team is looking like and also talking about your teams as I always do. But enough about all that. Let's go into my team and the reasoning behind these picks. Uh, and of course, there are alternatives. I always say this and I'll be mentioning some of the other ones who you know, I have an eye on and that could be making uh, their way into my team. But Robert Sanchez, 26.9% ownership is very high, uh, but there is a reason for that. But I'll be honest, I'm not completely sold on Robert Sanchez because he doesn't seem like a standout like Nick Pope when he was 4.5 million or Emiliano Martinez last year. But what I will say is that out of the 4.5 million goalkeepers, he is the best option on paper. But he's not someone that I'm that sold on, if that does make any sense. But a bit of kind of an overview about him. He took over from Matt Ryan last season around game week 13. And in 27 games, he conceded 27 goals and kept 10 clean sheets. So a pretty impressive record, especially considering the fact that he's 4.5 million. And he accumulated eight bonus points. He had the third best expected goals conceded per game, which was 1.08. And in terms of expected clean sheets, he was only behind Edison and Edouard Mendy with 0.37. So very impressive. And then you look at Brighton overall, and it's going to be a bit of a theme in this video. That's why I have at the moment anyway, free Brighton defenders technically. Uh, Brighton actually were among the best in the league last season. They conceded 46 goals, which was the seventh best in the entire division, and they kept 12 clean sheets, which was the fifth best. But not only that, but in terms of expected goals conceded, Brighton were the third best behind Chelsea and uh, City, of course, as I alluded to earlier. And yeah, in general with Brighton, I just think that they are going to concede um, quite a few shots, and that could in theory anyway, uh, enable you to rack up points, into, well, at least save points uh, for Robert Sanchez. But at the same time, Brighton are a decent defence. What I will say, though, with uh, Brighton defenders, and it's something that we should really consider, is the fact that with Ben White, it looks like he's going to be moving to Arsenal. I'll be talking about him in a bit. Uh, he is one of their best defenders, if not their best. And that could have a detrimental impact on how Brighton defend. And maybe all these underlying statistics like expected goals conceded, the amount of shots they concede and all of this, it might go wrong. And Brighton might be, I want to say a bad defence in the end. I still think they'll be pretty decent, but they might not be as solid as they were last season where they were unlucky not to keep even more clean sheets and to also just concede fewer goals in general. Um, but yeah, we'll wait and see what happens with that. But at the moment, I do think Robert Sanchez is the standout goalkeeper and yeah despite obviously my thoughts on him you know maybe not reaching the same uh, potential as Martinez and Pope I do think Sanchez is the one you should go for if you're looking for a 4.5 million option and of course if you're looking to rotate with someone like Dubravka when he returns from injury uh, then it makes perfect sense but um, at the moment uh, it looks like Dubravka is going to miss the beginning of the season and initially it was going to be Sanchez and Dubravka for me as my rotating goalkeeper pair but it's not looking likely at the moment and we might as well talk about the other kind of Brighton defenders so we've got Tariq Lamptey he's got 19.1% ownership and to be honest with Lamptey he's another one where once again he's got a lot of attacking potential he got one goal and three assists last season um, but he only kept two clean sheets when he actually was playing but then again uh, a season ridden uh, full of injuries but with Lamptey I'm just not so sure are Brighton as solid defensively when Lamptey is in the team of course um, that's down to interpretation and I don't think the sample size is big enough, uh, but with Lamptey, what I really like about him is the attacking upside, and he's just got great underlying numbers in terms of shots, goal threat, uh, assist potential. Uh, he can even win penalties, which is where a lot of his assists came from last season. So he's someone to keep an eye on, but what I will say about Lamptey is that we have to keep an eye on him. He is injury prone. That's another bad thing. But with 4.5 million defenders, a lot of them are just going to be centre backs who are just going to get you six points max. With Lamptey, though, he could arguably give you even higher 
um, number of points. So Lamptey is one of the more exciting defender options this season. And I think a double up with him and Sanchez makes perfect sense, to be honest. Um, would I triple up? Probably not. The reason why I have Ben White is because he's probably going to be nearing a move to Arsenal. And I think he will be nailed. It will be probably him and Gabriel starting. But of course, at this moment in time, it's all hypothetical. And I do think that Ben White could actually add something different to Arsenal. Having said that, I'm a bit kind of confused as why they're spending 50 million on him but Ben White was actually one of the top interceptors in the league last season and Arsenal were I think the third lowest in terms of interceptions made across the entire league um, definitely within the bottom five so maybe Ben White is going to be fitting into that profile adding something that Arsenal are lacking and he's also pretty decent coming out playing from the back which Arteta loves to do so Ben White could be a very interesting option and at 12.1%, another one who could do really well. And if he stays at Brighton, then I think it would just benefit Brighton in general. He's going to be nailed and he's just a good option. But of course, if he were to stay at Brighton, most people will be going for Veltman, for Lamptey and all these kind of other options who have a bit more attacking potential. With Ben White, you don't really see it with the goals and the assists, but maybe he can get one or two this season. But we're really just getting him in for being nailed and also just getting those clean sheets. And Arsenal were one of the best defences last season. They considered the third least amount of goals. And in terms of expected goals, they were in the top five. So yeah, Arsenal aren't a bad team whatsoever, especially defensively. And I think if Ben White does slot in pretty well there, then he'll be a good option. I do expect them to be nailed, as I said before. And then in terms of the rest of the defence, this is kind of where it gets a bit tricky because I am investing a lot of money here with these three players. But Luca Digne, a new manager, Rafael Benitez is in, and uh, he was actually speaking about um, Digne. He was saying that he's going to be back soon in training and that he's a professional. He wants to be back in the action. Um, so Digne could be right within the shout um, from the get-go and I do think with the fixtures that Everton have um, similar to Brighton of course uh, very good fixtures to start off with but Everton's are just exceptional and uh, you would expect a few clean sheets along the way but once again over the past we've been trolled by the likes of Luca Digne so it's going to be an interesting one he is heavily owned at 22.6 percent but having said that the majority of the games still don't have him so if he does get those assists as he has done over the past few years he got nine last season and then he had some more clean sheets and Everton are a bit more solid defensively then Luca Digne is a bargain I mean he was six million last season and now he's 5.5 so that's why a lot of people are kind of drawn to Luca Digne and I think he could do exceptionally well this season in terms of FPL points. It could be his highest scoring season yet and he's going to be at a very good price. So we'll wait and see what happens there. And then in terms of Liverpool defenders, I think Trent or Robertson, you'd want to have one of them uh, with the fixtures coming up. Um, my pick is Trent just because of all the underlying statistics and he pretty much trumped Robertson in every single stat. Um, and he is heavily owned once again, 27% ownership. Um, 7.5, once again, the highest uh, or the most priciest defender. Um, but there is a reason for that. And I do think that if Trent uh, can continue to start because sometimes he did get benched um, last season, especially when he was experiencing a downturn in form. Um, but I would expect him to, you know, have that fully behind him he had a very good end to this season I think he'll continue to start and if he does which uh, like I said I assume he will I think Trent Alexander-Arnold will be doing really well and I do expect him to once again start to get to the assist figures that we're used to from in the last couple of seasons if we look last season eight assists but a lot of them came towards the end and obviously before that 15 yeah. and 13 in the other two seasons so yeah we are expecting a bit more kind of goals and assists from him uh, but still you know the bar is set so high from the lacks of him and Robertson and I do think having one of them makes perfect sense so Trent Alexander-Arnold he's someone that you know you want to try fit into your team if possible but of course I understand if you can't and you want to invest in the likes of Harry Kane uh, Bruno Fernandes Salah De Bruyne etc it's very difficult to fit all of them in um, so you have to make some sacrifices here and there but I think Trent is worth the money and Luke Shaw I mean he had a great Euros arguably one of the best players in the tournament and I mean look at his ownership I mean this is something I haven't even checked myself 46% ownership it's crazy to be honest but um, there is a reason for that the fixtures are very good to begin the season with, but after that, you see from game week five, really, that's when the fixtures turn for the worse. And uh, there's a lot of reds there on the fixture difficulty rating. But I do think for the opening couple of games, Luke Shaw could be really good. But then again, I don't think he's a must-have. Um, you know, With that ownership, that would imply that 
you know, everyone has to have him. I don't think so. What I would say, though, is that he had the same amount of assists last season as Juan Pisaka, but you look at the underlying statistics and Shaw should have gotten many more assists. Um, so maybe this season is where he's going to get a bit more end product uh, because of better finishing from his teammates. And uh, it will be interesting to see how the likes of Jaden Sancho coming into the team will impact Luke Shaw and his performances, not only in real life, but also in FPL. So that's going to be really interesting. But I have to say this, um, with the fixture swing in game week five and also his ownership, it does kind of put me off Luke Shaw and I might even potentially uh, switch him up for another defender, maybe save a bit of money there and invest the rest of the money in the midfield and attack. But we'll wait and see there. Now, Harvey Barnes is an interesting one. Um, he's 8% owned and the ownership keeps changing because I think the other day I checked he was 8.2%, but Harvey Barnes is very interesting and he was having very good form. He was in very good form before his injury that he suffered in late February against Arsenal. And what I would say is that with Harvey Barnes and Ian Acho, it's going to be really interesting to see what happens there because it's very difficult to foresee both of them playing in the same team unless someone like Jamie Vardy is going to go to the bench or something like that. But uh, I do suspect Harvey Barnes is going to continue to play. Ian Acho might be the one who suffers and goes to the bench. Uh, and if Barnes does start, I think he's going to be one of the best midfielders at 7 million this season. He got nine goals and five assists last season. And in terms of shots uh, on average per 90 minutes, he was second of all Leicester players. So there's a lot of good underlying statistics about Harvey Barnes. And if you compare it to James Madison, for example, there's a big over-reliance for the Englishman, um, for Madison, in terms of set pieces and creating a lot of chances from those situations. With Harvey Barnes, he has a lot of threat uh, in terms of open play um, and yeah he's just you compare it to uh, for example James Madison I think he had one big chance across the whole season and Harvey Barnes had nine something ridiculous like that so with Harvey Barnes I think he is the better pick out of him and James Madison if you're looking at it from a purely statistical point of view but uh, don't discount Madison I still think he's a good option he's going to be a bit more highly owned but with Harvey Barnes less ownership better underlying stats and people are going to forget about him because obviously he was injured for a significant portion of last season. And I do think if he ended the season, he would have gotten more points, of course. And I think he would have maybe been 7.5 or 8 million pounds this year. Um, so he could be a very good bargain, in my opinion. And the fixtures to begin with, pretty decent, to be fair, um, for a long period of time. Up until, I mean, just look at that. Even up until you could say game week 18, the fixtures are really good if you're looking at the FDR. But of course, that will be subject to change. Uh, but yeah, I particularly like the opening three fixtures. West Ham could be a very difficult one, but Norwich and Wolves, you could suspect some points there for Harvey Barnes, for Iheanacho, depending on who starts. Uh, but it's going to be very interesting to see. So keep an eye on Leicester City in pre-season. They could be one to look out for. And then in terms of the rest of the midfield, it's going to be very, I'd say, template, templatey, if that's even a word. Uh, but Mohamed Salah, I think, is a must-have. And yeah, his ownership is almost 50%. And with good reason, he's the just a top scoring player pretty much every single season. Last season was an exception with Bruno Fernandes, but Mohamed Salah is just uh, FPL gold, really. And a very good fixture to start off with, with Liverpool. And Norwich away. <laughs> I mean, a few seasons ago, uh, he had a very good start against Norwich. Last season, scored a hat-trick against Leeds United. Um, so maybe Salah could do something similar once again. He's definitely going to be my captain in this moment in time anyway, unless I change my mind. But I don't want to overcomplicate that kind of uh, decision. But Mohamed Salah, I mean, he's on penalties. His underlying stats are always good. Even when he has a kind of downturn in form, he's still getting the shots away. He's still creating chances. And of course, the penalties can always swing uh, the points in his favour. So Salah is someone that you don't want to talk about too much. He's going to be heavily owned. He is going to form a big part of the template and with good reason. But I think Salah is worth it. And then Bruno Fernandes. Now, it's an interesting one because in 2021 and also the end of last season, Bruno Fernandes was just not getting the points. And uh, apart from maybe triple game week 35 that I can remember, uh, Bruno Fernandes was just not delivering in most weeks. But with the fixtures to start this season with, especially um, you'd say the opening four, I think Bruno Fernandes could get off to a flying start. And some of these teams are teams he hauled against. So Leeds United, I think he got 17 points against them last season. Same with Southampton in big, big victories for Manchester United. So it's going to be very interesting to see. But uh, yeah, his ownership, once again, over 40%. 
and uh, yeah, not too surprised by that. And I think penalties, you know, adding Jaden Sancho, he also has the ability to win penalties. I just think Man United are going to continue to win a lot of them this season and Bruno Fernandes will uh, bear the fruits of it and uh, he's obviously got the assist potential, he's on set pieces. Bruno Fernandes is Manchester United's best player or second best player and definitely from an FPL perspective he is the standout but with £12 million you could also go for Kevin De Bruyne, he's going to be a differential and I don't think it's uh, as simple as oh, Bruno Fernandes is must own and you know don't go for De Bruyne or even invest the money up front in Harry Kane because I do think they could outscore Bruno this season um, but I still think Bruno Fernandes is going to be one of the highest scoring players if not the highest this season and he is worth the 12 million. But, of course, like I said before, bear in mind that his form towards the end wasn't very good. In the Euros, he didn't have a good tournament, um, so it's going to be interesting to see how he carries on this season, but I do suspect he's going to start off pretty well. And then, in terms of the rest of my midfield, Rafinha's in there, and to be honest, his fixtures are very poor, so you could arguably not even go for him at the beginning. There's no real need. Some very tough fixtures, um, but he is capable of scoring even against Manchester United and Liverpool. Uh, of course, the fixture swing from around game week three or five, depending on how you look at it, uh, is very, very appealing. And uh, just getting him in now does save a free transfer later down the line. He is owned by a significant portion of the game, nearly one quarter of all FPL managers. And Rafinha, if you compare him to Harrison, for example... Very similar. Harrison got more points uh, with more minutes, of course, but in terms of underlying numbers, Rafinha trumped Harrison in pretty much every individual stat, uh, apart from maybe big chances. So Rafinha is an interesting one. He's more consistent, I'd say, than Harrison, who's more explosive and inconsistent. But Rafinha, around 6.5 million, who else will get you that many points on a consistent basis every single week? Not many. Um, so I do think at 6.5 million, uh, excluding the fixtures out of it, I do think he is the standout. But then again, you have Buendia with three great opening fixtures and he's 6.5 million too, uh, playing with some very good players. If Grealish stays, Aston Villa could have a very good attack going into this season. So it's going to be very interesting, but I do think Rafinha is a great option this season, but maybe it's worth just holding on, uh, seeing how Leeds United play as well and uh, waiting for the fixtures to turn before getting the Brazilian. So that's something um, to look at. And then Brownhill is probably one of the better options at 4.5 million, but to be honest, it's just mainly because he's nailed. And with these 4.5 million options, you don't want to look too much into underlying stats or who has the most goals or assists because it's pretty irrelevant, really. Uh, in the end, they're not going to get you too many in most cases. And with Brownhill, he's just there to get you the two or three points every single week. Uh, Burnley have some okay fixtures to start off with, pretty mixed bag. Um, but I don't know, Burnley could actually struggle uh, to begin this season with and then maybe gradually grow into the season just as they did last season. So that's something to keep an eye on. But yeah, with these 4.5 million options, you mainly just want to look at someone who's playing and that's what Brownhill is um, you know, doing in my team. And as for the attack, just to finish off this team, um, we've got Antonio in there. In terms of underlying numbers, he's pretty much the king there and... Decent ownership, I have to say, very decent ownership. He did actually sustain uh, an injury uh, in preseason, so that's something to monitor and keep an eye on. Um, the obviously main concern of Antonio always is the injury record, but the fixtures are very good to start the season with, and I think that if he can stay fit, he's going to just do the business once again, and he's one of the best options at 7.5 million. I think that's a good price for him. I think it's uh, fair, and uh, yeah, I like the ownership too. It really appeals to me. Of course, some fixtures like Man United and Leicester, pretty difficult on paper, but I do think Antonio has the ability to still score in those games. And he even has a bit of assist potential there as well. Um, but of course, at 7.5 million, there are other options like Iannaccio. Have to see if he's going to continue to start, as I alluded to earlier. Um, but yeah, I think there's quite a few. There's also Cavaluin at 8 million if you can stretch to him. And he's someone I would really like with those opening set of fixtures for Everton. And I do think Cavaluin could get some even better service this season and also get some more points. And then Watkins, he's someone that I actually never had at any point last season in FPL. And his ownership is pretty 
ridiculous to be honest uh, over 30 percent but you look at those opening three fixtures and you can see why and even when the fixtures turn for the worse around game week four um, the good thing is one Watkins can score against those teams he's done in the past and two at 7.5 million you have a bit of flexibility to either downgrade or move to someone of a similar price like Calvert-Lewin or Iheanacho uh, in game week four and the kind of fixture swing coincides with positive fixture swings for other players so Ollie Watkins is someone who's good to have for the first three weeks and then you can assess and see what happens there um, but in terms of Aston Villa in general with those fixtures that you see there uh, for the opening 10 game weeks I would recommend just having one um, two max I wouldn't be tripling up on Aston Villa even with those great fixtures to start the season with because it's just going to be too many transfers uh, to get rid of them if you're looking to maybe chase some fixtures and you have plans to get other players in but Ollie Watkins is in at the moment but like I said before I never had him last season and those fixtures aren't looking very good from game week four onwards so something worth keeping an eye on and then of course I mean how could I even forget Ivan Tony is on my bench as well um, he is heavily owned at one point he was owned by more than 40 percent of the game I'll be honest I'm not completely sure about him but um has 6.5 million some good opening fixtures I think he could actually score against Arsenal um, as well um, I think Tony could actually be a, a very good uh, player to start the season with of course uh, there is a fixture swing a significant one uh, from game week six onwards um, but for the opening five fixtures I think Tony could do some damage but once again we'll wait and see uh, he did very well in the championship he set the all-time goal scoring record there but how will he do in the Premier League it could go one of two ways really um, but we'll wait and see with Tony and uh, should be a very interesting one but of course I do see why some people are maybe going for Watkins, Antonio and Calvert-Lewin or players around that price and just kind of disregarding the likes of Tony I completely understand that there's definitely quite a lot of options being thrown around uh, there's going to be more games being played in pre-season so that's something to definitely keep an eye on and uh, just in general I think we need to just wait and see have kind of a solid idea of maybe the 20 to 40 players that you really want to have into your team maybe just have a first draft sorted out for now and then in the week leading up to game week one that's when I would start finalizing my team when we have more information and uh, yeah we'll just be in a better position to make more informed decisions uh, but that's just my advice to you that's my opinion and that is my first draft let me know what you think and remember all the statistics that I took um, or that I stated today come from Fantasy Football Hub I write and edit for them uh, so if you want check down the links in the description below including all of the articles that I write um, but yeah appreciate all the support across the whole season in Euro Fantasy in UCL Fantasy and in FPL I really appreciate it and if you haven't already smash the like button and subscribe for new around here and yeah as always I appreciate the support and appreciate all the comments and the feedback and uh, the back and forth that we have uh, turn on the notification bell um, so you can see all of my future uploads and live streams and you can also engage with my community posts on YouTube and follow me on Twitter and Instagram it's Dylan underscore RCM it's the same as my YouTube handle and uh, I look forward to seeing you on there as well you can contact me about your teams whether in private messages or public messages and uh, yeah just talking about football and FPL UCL fantasy and also future kind of international tournament fantasy games that are coming our way. But thank you for watching and I'll see you next time.